I am very excited about uh, our guest today, Ed Baumgartner. Uh, I haven't actually met Ed in person yet. I'm sure our paths are going to cross in person here soon, uh, but uh, have visited with him on the phone and and uh, through emails and and then uh, so I'm I'm looking really looking forward to this presentation as well to get to know Ed and his company a little bit more. Uh, we came across, and, and, and again, this is the last in this series on regenerative seed growers. And this one's going to be pretty unique because Ed's not growing cover crop seed like all of the other guys did. He's growing hybrid corn. and, and But that's really important because almost all of our customers are growing corn at some point in the rotation. And so I wanted to bring a fresh perspective on there are people within the hybrid seed breeding industry who are doing some of the same concepts, following some of the same principles that we as regenerative farmers are doing as well. And so I just thought that that has got a great background, very unique perspectives, and the way that he's doing thing, uh, the way that he's doing things and selecting uh, the, the corn hybrids that he's putting out into the market are definitely unique within the industry. And we think a better fit for our farm. So I was telling Ed earlier, we got a pallet of bass hybrid corn seed just today, got delivered today. Uh, we're putting out a fairly good sized non-GMO plot and a lot of the hybrids are gonna be the, the bass hybrids. And so if we have time at the end, we can maybe talk just a little bit more about uh, what they have available, but all of Ed's uh, genetics are non-GMO and they're being done in a regenerative environment. So again, that makes him pretty unique uh, Ed will give a little bit of his background, but he's been in the farming and the corn seed breeding business since he was, what, 16, 17 years old, got a really early start on it, has been in it many, many years. He'll show some pictures. They've got a, a farm and a development facility in Puerto Rico, as well as in Minnesota. Uh, so they're doing work all year round uh, at one or the other of the facilities there. So very excited, Ed. Uh, to have you share. I know you've got a lot of great uh, pictures and information. So uh, Ed Bobgarner with Bass Hybrids, uh, located in Minnesota, but half the year in Puerto Rico too, I think. So Ed, take it away. Yeah, thanks Keith, very much. You know, during the cold months, you like to be in Puerto Rico, so that's a good component for us. But that's a good I, strategy. Yeah, that we're finally being successful at it after all these years. But uh, I, I guess the one thing I'd like to start out with is, is probably with all this continuous nursery work, I've probably been around 108 or nine crops now that I've been responsible for since I started at, at age 16. So it, it's kind of fun to, to see things and what you think is true doesn't always hold true over time. And I'm working on trying to share here that we can get going and let's see PowerPoint. And we'll get this up and running. And uh, yep, that, that looks good, Ed. We can see that real well. Okay, thank you. I'm a, really a, a newbie to this type of stuff. So you're I, doing I'm fine. A little more old fashioned, I guess. But <laughs> uh, so basically, we didn't. I, I'm new to regenerative agriculture. I was trained in better living through chemistry. Uh, and but things were happening and I didn't understand. And so that's taken us towards the biology part. And then how we really do fit in regenerative agriculture. And, you know, when you start a business, you start out and it builds over time. And so we're, we're like on our fifth company iteration now. And, and uh, they're still active. So we have Third Millennium Genetics still active as a contract research organization in Puerto Rico. Uh, then we were, we developed our genetics under 3MG R&D. But then I when I bought my business partners out from down in that company, then that became Bass Genetics in 2019. Uh, 3MG North is our contract research organization in Minnesota. And then Bass Hybrids uh, is, our, is our retail brand uh, that we sell the hybrids that we develop. And so all the companies work together, but yet they're independent from each other. And so uh, anyway, that's the story. And Dura Yield is our trademark then for naturally developed native traits. I think the, the terminology trait has been hijacked by GMOs. The number one trait is still yield, but we never talk about that as a trait anymore. And that's number one. Then how we protect that yield, those are additional traits. And then it's a matter if they're transgenic or naturally occurring. And so this is the kind of picture that any given time we have 
you know, every summer we've got a nursery here up in Olivia where we're trying to fine tune the maturity of the products. And then in the winter, we're advancing. We'll grow anywhere from one to three generations of, of different breeding projects every, win every winter. And then, uh, of course, we're set up, I think this is out in Gettysburg, or, or no, Washburn, North Dakota, uh, for yield trial planting. Again, another no-till situation. And so we do our yield testing in every type of condition we can find, which was different than when I was in the seed industry working for somebody else. That was always corn on beans, highest yielding uh, soil you can find. We do our work with trying to farm like farmers do to develop crops that work. So that's strip till, no till, uh, using starter fertilizer or pop-up fertilizer. We're, we're set up to do it all. And you'll see some of that as I go through the slides. So this is where it all started with Third Millennium Genetics in Puerto Rico. And I welcome people to come visit us in the wintertime. It's, it's uh, postcard weather from December through March. Just so if you're getting tired of the cold, come see us. We'd love to give you a tour of what's going on. So uh, San Isabel is a town to the left. And as you can see, if you look on a map of Puerto Rico, we're in the actual point on Puerto Rico in the center. We're in that our farm is where the office facilities where the arrow is at. And this is kind of a quick overview of the farm when we're in action. This is from my, I think, two winters ago. And, and so you can see the facility and then different plantings of corn. And uh, probably there was some cotton and sorghum in here at the same time. Uh, this is our other farm that's a little further north uh, up on our Porvenir farm. This is where we had our research nursery in 2022. And you can see all the brown bags on in there. We, we do hand pollinate somewhere around 150,000 to 200,000 bags a year in our program. And then we got our contract work off to the side. You'll see sunflowers and sorghum. Uh, there was a tractor planting over there, uh, you know, a soybean project that was being planted in, in January. Uh, when this was filmed up on the left, you see where there's some harvest was already done. So we've got crops on all stages. And if you want to learn about pest control, try to try to work with uh, anywhere from 20 different crops in any different growth stage at the same time. That gives you a little bit of a workout. So we're, we're using the technology that's available for research. So this is a SRES planter, RTK, computer-driven precision planter. And uh, we use drip irrigation and we apply the drip tape and the fertilizer before we plant with the RTK that allows us to do that now. And then we can just come in and plant right alongside the tape. And then you can see how, what it looks like when it's properly irrigated. Not every day works out like that, but this was a good day. Um, you know, we have high press, pest pressure in Puerto Rico. So we have uh, five of these sprayers down there to run across our 500 acres. And with all the different crops, it's easier if you have different sprayers set up for different crops. And in corn, to grow tempered corn, I budget 21 times to spray. That's my budget. We'll go up from that, but never down, uh, depending upon what the scouting shows us for fall armyworm, uh, spider mites, uh, thrips, you name it. You name the pest. So we have them all except European corn borer. And don't bring any with you when you come down to visit. We, we don't need another pest to, to play with. Uh, this is just a picture of our foundation corn processing because we'll do seed increases beside the basic... Uh, uh, development work and so that we can grow two increases in the winter time of a new line to get a hybrid out quickly we do that for contract work and and for ourselves and so there used to be a roof on this uh, machinery until Hurricane Maria came by and I haven't gotten around to affording to put a new one up yet and so then our northern location up here in Olivia 3MG North uh, we found that this, we can do contract work in the south and, you know, in Puerto Rico and in the north. And uh, it, uh, and then we do all our, our testing for the materials we develop here in addition to the contract work. And just give you an idea, there's a lot of volume that goes through this facility as well. And, and how it's set up to go planted when it's on those metal rods in the boxes, that's ready to go as a planter. And then, the, you know, we also do work in, in cereals and, and canola, you know, whatever we can find for contract work. And we're set up to, to do all that. And, and uh, this is our road crew. When we go out in the road for planting, you have a big truck that carries all the seed, a truck to haul the equipment, and then a sprayer goes with us because, you know, almost everybody we work with is Roundup ready and we do not want Roundup on our plots. So we carve out a little bit and we have to do all the pest control ourselves or, you know, weed control. 
And of course, we got the one picture in the right with one of the combines on the trailer as well. It's the, you know, how we're equipped to get around. We tested three states and um, and 18 locations in those three states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota. And then I work with a, a business associate that works in Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois. And uh, he'll come up a little bit later in the discussion here. But this is a eight row uh, planter and, and uh, two people plant into eight rows. That's a splitter that was on the left to divide the seed up. Uh, again, uh, no-till. And so we're set up uh, to plant in real live conditions. And believe me, I've learned a couple of hard lessons myself because uh, you know, no one comes there to tell you how to set a planter until you make a few mistakes and you just kind of learn over time. And uh, so we got two of these eight row planters that can go on the road and plant. And it takes a staff of three to run each one. Then we have our nursery planter that stays around Olivia. And uh, each that one you have to plant in each row individually. And uh, and so this is the last year we did tillage in 2022. Now everything we're doing is, is no-till on our nursery work and planting into cover crops. This will be our second year of doing that. And this was my first four-way in, uh, into planting into annual ryegrass. We killed it after, uh, after we planted. We sprayed with the sprayer rig you saw. And then this is the results here at the end of the month, you know, early June. It looked like this. I, I was totally impressed. This is, this is what wrote me into... Uh, regenerative agriculture. It's like, we can do this. We've got to figure out how to, how to play this game. And so on this picture, it's uh, one, of our, one of our planters, but in the middle, you can see two funnels in front of my oldest daughter, Rachel, and my, my and Susan, our corn breeders on the right. And then my other daughter, Rebecca, the youngest one is on the left. They're, they're planting the seed where Rachel's dumping in the liquid and furrow seed treatments. And we can do this as biology or fertilizers, so, you know, you get a lot going on on the planter that's all, and it's all computer controlled and RTK driven. Uh, this is what one of our fields looks like here in Olivia when we get the different crops growing for the different contract work we do. And so I think it's always good for us to be exposed to crops besides corn so we understand uh, just more about growing. I mean, uh, I, I spent like the first 20 years of my career only in corn. And then the, the last 20 now have been uh, in a lot of crops. Like we've done over 22 in Puerto Rico and I think we're at 12 in, in Minnesota. And this is just a sidebar a little bit. We developed some early beans to go overseas for our overseas uh, sales. And these are four zero beans. They didn't exist until we did this project. And you had to light, you know, get the day length the same as the beans would be grown in to make the selections for the early plants. So that was kind of a fun project. Uh, this is what it looks like, you know, shoot bagging, pollinating. We use Julian days in our bags to know what day it's pollinated and uh, when the, it helps us, you know, do all the math easy to figure out maturities by flowering date. You know, better go. And this is in Puerto Rico. You can see the insect damage, even though we're spraying the, the 21 times on our nursery. Uh, some things are more susceptible than others. But it's just, you know, the process, you see, we, we do somewhere around 150,000 of those a year just in our project. And then when we do it for higher, especially in Puerto Rico, it's, it's we will probably do over a half a million of these or better with our staff. And so, I, you know, we like to be out there and get in with them uh, doing the work all the time. <clears throat> so we also do silage testing. So we're very uh, livestock oriented with our products. We want nutrition, uh, feed value. And uh, we're one of the very few people that actually take the time to do all the chopping and NIR work out there as a con uh, contract research organization. And of course, all our products are tested for silage if they meet the criteria first in, in the grain trials. And so we're sample every one uh, with a sampler. Then it goes into our trailer where we have the staff doing the uh, uh, taking the, the quality ratings and we get the moisture at, from the NIR as well for determining yield. So this is my youngest daughter, Rebecca, out in the nursery, working with the harvest. Of course, my dog is sleeping on the good ears. So um, as people get to know us, they know we like to have dogs around. They're always in the office. And, and we don't have enough time to go hunting, but we sure go out in the field with the dogs a lot. So, um, and of course, in the sophisticated equipment for doing the harvest, we do four-row and eight-row plots, 20-foot long, 40-foot long. The eight rows by 40 foot long harvesting the center four give us a very close uh, feel for what the farmer is actually going to see in his field. 
And since those are big plots, they take up a lot of space in, in the field. Uh, we only do those on our most advanced materials. And here we're collecting moisture and test weight with that device in the, in the combine. And uh, so when we get down to the field, we can upload the data and know what won the plot within uh, a few hours. So now we're getting to the retail side and started this business this is in a neighboring town from us in Olivia and Danny, but it's about four miles away. The two offices are apart and this is all due to the retail. We keep that separate from our, from our contract research business and uh, you know, climate controlled warehouses, the whole nine yards. It's all, and we do all our seed is stored untreated. We do not treat until we sell a bag of corn. And then we have several options. But the future, and I'm targeting 2027, is to be all biological seed treatments, if any seed treatment going forward. And so then, you know, we call it unconventional corn because we can get tied into, you know, off patent products or cheap corn is conventional corn. You know, there's a lot of technology in, in our native tolerant corn and, and uh, the effort that goes into it. And so we're not going to be the cheapest price seed out there or lowest cost seed, but we're probably going to be one of the best value seed products you can buy because we're so focused on, on the genetics and, uh, and to figure out how these, these work. And again, this is what led us to regenerative agriculture. We have a couple hybrids that have been going on in regenerative scene now where they have cover crops planted in between the rows and, and they're excelling in that. And so you know, as we have droughts, I like adverse weather for doing our research work because we get comparisons like this. And this was, you know, going on four years ago, three and a half years ago now. But, you know, the, the pictures, this is what we see out there. And so I know the stress breeding is working. <clears throat> uh, this is where it comes to bite us a little bit as they stay healthy under stress. And so then you're getting compared to the one that died and and they harvest it early, they have to wait an extra two weeks to harvest ours because it's still healthy. The only good part is uh, the, the yields are there because they stayed green, but we can get a lot of phone calls when they see this side by side today. Uh, this is taken last year where we were dry and the, and the rains came later. And you can see the nitrogen stress on the, um, this was the one on the right is our neighbor's corn and he manages for 240 bushel of corn and uh, didn't have enough moisture, I think, to pull the nitrogen through. And then our corn, we only had 80 pounds on the, on the other side and that's just border corn around our nursery. This is out of a field that had high rootworm pressure, uh, no insecticides, no extra treatments on the product on the left, that's just breeding that gave it at least as good of roots as a national brand with the triple stack. I mean, and I, I quit using insecticide when we went on our own because I got tired of breathing and sitting on the planter. And when you have your kids in the in the business, you don't want them exposed to all the toxins I've been exposed to. So another reason why we're moving towards regenerative in the business. Uh, so some of genetics, uh, also known as KMR, they do contract research work like we do. We met in 2011, decided we wanted to work together developing genetics and uh, we thought we could conquer by dividing the maturity in half. So Kyle and, and his wife, Brenda, supplies of genetics to our brand from, let's say, 103 to full season. We work on from like 108 down to 75 or earlier uh, if we can get it because we like to work in the far north and uh, probably make a move into Canada here in the near future. So one of the crazy things, you know, like I said, we did a lot of work on GMOs and uh, one of the big companies came out with a with a, a drought tolerant gene that wasn't tolerant to heat. You have to have heat tolerance before you get to drought tolerance. And, and we get the high heat every day in Puerto Rico. And that high heat leads to uh, uh, um, things that we'll go over here a little bit later in the presentation, but uh, we get high cold tolerance from high heat tolerance. 70% of the genes are related. And uh, I just, this is one of the most mind blowing things. And that led us down the path of trying to figure out what other relationships are there. So that when you have flooded soils, if you have high drought tolerance, you, you tend to fare the flooding situations with your crop too, because you have the, the drought tolerant corn. That was another surprise. I don't have any pictures to show that, but uh, I, I do have some concerns. Uh, I'm a lot less concerned about rootworm 
uh, this year than I have been. We found some biological products that really help us with rootworm control on conventional corn. That's one of the most difficult questions we have to get over with. We talk to a grower. Native tolerance works, but nobody wants to talk about it. And it's very hard to find, but we figured out how to do that. And then combining that with biological products is, is giving us excellent control. The weak point for us today is European corn borer because the fall army worm, corn earworm, and, and other grasshoppers and those types of pests we have in Puerto Rico, that doesn't transfer over at more than a, maybe a 70% uh, correlation to European corn borer. And so we've got a little bit more work to do there, but we've been working with um, finding more native genes that help that in addition to uh, looking for bio biology that'll help us. As far as the other leafhopper spider mites, we have really solid native control on those because they're very highly present in Puerto Rico when we do our nose spray work. So you'll notice that you know, when we call something dura yield, it tends to be very dark, wide leaf, green, uh, may, and not as upright as what you're used to in the scene in the industry. Massive root systems, big brace root systems, and this picture in the center should look familiar if anyone saw uh, University of Wisconsin put out a publication in 2018 and saying this was uh, nitrogen fixing corn they found in Mexico. And after you saw that, it thought, well, let's go take a closer look at our corn. Well, there it is. Look at that. I'm not claiming we have it. I'm just saying that we see some of the same traits because of the stress breeding. And these are some of the surprises. And so this is a hybrid that we actually sell. It was sold in Colorado into a uh, a dairy out there that was switching to organic on this farm. They called up all nervous 40 beetles per plant. We went out there to look at it. This plant was pulled, not dug. And you can't hardly find on those roots where a beetle had fed. And so they were pleasantly surprised at how good their yields were with that much beetle pressure. So native resistant works. There was no biology applied to anything. This was just what the plant had for native tolerance. And for a tidbit of information, uh, is that uh, University of Missouri has only found native rootworm resistance in early flints and Caribbean flints. And the source for our uh, rootworm resistance is coming from Caribbean flints. But guess what? There's no rootworms in the Caribbean. There's only nematodes. So I guess we have nematode and, and uh, rootworm tolerance from the Caribbean flints that are in our material in the background. Uh, this is just a photo showing we, we dig out our plants to take data that we need for registering hybrids in Europe. We do have an international business where we're selling conventional corn where they do not allow GMOs. And uh, you can just see the difference in root systems between the hybrids. And you could also see we had a little trench compaction on a couple of those where the roots followed the, the trench. I got a little nervous and planted too early last year. So this is where it gets fun. I'm going to move a little bit more into the technical part. And uh, so the, the blue box is the typical normal tillage, high yield, all the groceries type of field. The orange box is a little bit lower, uh, lighter soil in our area in Renville County, very productive county. And then the gray box is where we have the reduced nitrogen. And so we set up the yield goal for 200 bushel and uh, we fertilize that field at 25% uh, less because that was kind of the buzz. So basically between taking a soil test for nitrates and then we added uh, uh, synthetic fertilizer to get us up to 150 pounds of nitrogen available for the corn. And so you can see that when we add tropical into the mix a little bit and you know we're multiple crop cycles into the development stage. Uh, so people talk about fast breeding, you know, like dihaploids you know, and, and molecular marker breeding and CRISPR, all these topics. Yeah, that helps you develop the line faster, but you still got to test everything. And that just takes years. You get one season to do that. And so with our breeding in Puerto Rico, we can make selections every generation uh, under high stress and then at the same time do the yield testing. So they come together side by side. Um, and so the the box that represents the, uh, let's say the LSD of the of the the trial, the line in the center is equal to the mean of the trial. 100% is where the checks are at, and we're selecting for materials over 100%. The and the, when you get to the lines, 
that would be the outliers, how far they go. And we're really looking for the outliers to the top to make selections, to, to make the genetic gain that we need to make to, to develop future, future products. And the, the one on the right has native corn borer tolerance. And so that's why I said we're working on that. And we've got projects with native corn borer tolerance so that we can bring the complete package between rootworm corn borers. And it'll be all naturally stacked products. Uh, so we'll have real traits. Now, uh, just to give you an idea, the, the, the graph on the left, you can see that that particular breeding family did did well under all the groceries. The, the second one with a little more stress from being dry did a little bit better, but when we reduced the nitrogen, that was the best performance. Now, who would think you take away nitrogen that uh, performance would get better? This stuff was mind boggling to me. Well, we go to the next, we, we look at the data set a little bit. And the one I have highlighted in yellow here, that shows performance under normal rate corn, 103% of the check, you know, what the normal yield was. And then we look where we did a 25% a, a reduction. You know, that's 123% of the check. We had one that was better. But when you look at over what uh, the yield level was of the 25% the less uh, nitrogen, it was by far the best yielding one. So I thought, okay, let's follow this. We we take the this parent stock and we take it down to Puerto Rico and exploit it, you know, create more variation or select more variation out of that ear. So on the left is what you see there. And so these ear selections then were looked at last summer in 2023 in our nursery that was no-till cover crop, low, uh, no applied nitrogen fertilizer or any synthetic fertilizer. Uh, I put on a little 28%, uh, uh, maybe 25 pounds or so, just because I was nervous. I'm not going to do that this year. I don't think I have to. Anyway, this showed no nitrogen stress before harvest. No, there was no fire into the leaves up. And so I think we have nitrogen tolerance or something in, in this line. And this is my wife sorting out ears that they are, her and our corn breeder, Susan, harvested uh, last summer as well. She's, she's selecting, we try and rank them best to worst and then label them and package them up. And, and uh, we like to see how much they change from what they look like um, in the nursery to a couple of years down the road. So picture on the left is native insect tolerance from Puerto Rico where this is uh, fall army worm going after things this last winter hard. This nursery was sprayed and uh, you can see on the, the right, that's Debbie Wave and we're out there pollinating. And you can see the damage. I'm working over there, turn around, wave at you. And then my daughter, Beck, is just panning around. You see the damage. And all of a sudden, we're getting to this one coming up here that there is no damage on whatsoever. And there is no BT in this. We always check because <laughs> people think you're crazy. But it, it it's amazing how uh, these native tolerances do work. And when they're in there, they're in, the, in their solid, it's multiple genes. It's, it's hard to move them to get that kind of protection. Uh, when, you know, when I was doing conversion work for my former employer, it was uh, basically, um, you know, one gene at a time. And it got complicated when we got up to smart stacks with, with eight genes. This is we're probably moving 30 to 40 genes at a time to get the kind of control that you're looking at. So you're probably going, why are you showing me this nursery? It's so ugly. Well, we plant in the dry soil in Puerto Rico. We irrigate to germinate it. This field to create the, strauss, the, the, the drought stress that I want, we irrigate it up so everything comes up and then I stop watering until it starts to pollinate. And then I turn on the irrigation to, to pollinate it and then I turn off the water again and let it fill. That's all it gets for water. And so we're probably at 55% of what the crop needs. Uh, to develop normally, maybe even a little less than that. And this material hadn't been cycled through for two breeding cycles. We were just working on yield. Because you notice our our tag, our trademark is Dura yield. We had a lot of Dura, not enough yield. Now we're bringing the yield to go with the Dura yield. And this is how we got it. And I just wanted to cycle back again to make sure we're maintaining the, the Dura. And these are the ears we just harvested out of this here in, in March. Uh, in April. And there's not a lot there, but this is what we're going to blow up and run through a nursery like this again. And this is going to be the base 
material now for the probably things coming out in 2030 would be my guess. I haven't done the, all the timelines yet, but it should be around 2030 when it'd be available to a commercial grower, uh, descendants from this material, this work. But here's here's when you do all that effort, what they look like. And, and you can see that in the center one, Vanessa's one we had good luck with, and that one's related to the one that was out in Colorado with the rootworm uh, issues. This one does the same thing. Um, and then you can see there's almost no ear size difference between the high end and low end. Uh, the, uh, on the left, you see we're working in no-till, wheat strip till, soybeans. Maria is a new hybrid that's gonna be coming out here for planting in 2025. Nova is an 85 day hybrid that we sell uh, quite a bit of now. And it's very nutritious for livestock. It has about a half percent to a percent oil more than uh, number two yellow corn. And so that's a, a quick snapshot of, of 20, 19 years worth of work, Keith. So I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep out there or you. <laughs> no, no, that, that was great. We appreciate uh, you sharing, but also just really appreciate all the great work uh, that you're doing in the space uh, because, I, you, you know, just looking from the outside in, it's obvious that there's a lot of work that goes into this. There's there's a lot of, you know, it's messy. It's messy work. And I think a lot of us who are just, you know, buying the seed, you know, don't understand all of the all of the steps and the processes that it takes to get there. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I got a few things. Uh, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen here and let's just yeah, have a little, a little bit of a conversation here and then we'll take some questions from the audience as well. Yes, I'm, I'm having trouble. For, oh, here it is. Never mind. I'm, like I said, I'm a rookie at this. I know <laughs> you did. You did great there. Um, so I want to go back to something that you talked about kind of in the beginning. You you mentioned that you kind of feel like the, the word or the term trait has been hijacked. Uh, and, and I would tend to agree with you, you know, hijacked by the GMO. Because when we think of, oh, this is a trait in corn, oh, well, yeah. it has to be GMO. Uh, but not necessarily. You know, you talked about yield as being the most important trait, but all the other things that go into that. So I just, I just want to reiterate and make sure people understand that you're developing all these traits, but it's 100% through conventional breeding methods and there's no GMO components, correct? Correct. I, I think that uh, the good Lord put everything we needed in the genomes that in the crops that he provided us. And we it's just up to us to figure out how to uh, make it work in the direction we want it to go. You know, and, uh, and so we don't have to poison our environment with all these synthetic products anymore. Mm. And, so, yeah. and, and and to build on that point, you know, you mentioned that you've got a lot of family members involved in the operation, you know, wife, your your daughters. Uh, and, and that was a big emphasis for you is to not have that high chemical environment for them to be working in as well, right? Correct. Correct. I mean, I, I, I know what it's done to my body over the, you know, 40 years I've been exposed and I just want to reduce that for the future generations. And uh, I, I think that's very admirable. And I think that many of our listeners, many of our customers would, would be right there with you on that, wanting to do that, but at times at a loss of how to do that, because, you know, we, we've gotten conditioned to, to the point where we feel like that's a tool that we would have difficulty giving up. But then we see pictures, you know, from your nurseries that, you know, have all sorts of insect pressure, but yet there are some that can survive. So that kind of gives us hope. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and to put it in perspective, when we do, do these development nurseries, we throw away 99% of what we do. I mean, it's kind of depressing. When I first started in the business doing that. It's like, really, we're throwing away all this work, but you know, now, and, and so they get treated like our kids too, you know, and we do name our hybrids instead of putting a number on them. I think they deserve a little more respect than just <laughs> You know, because yeah. I always joke when I worked in the corporate world, I was just a number, you know, and, and uh, you know, and I don't want our hybrids to feel like that either. So <laughs> every every hybrid has its own name. So so yeah, how do you what what do you have to do to get on the list? Do you have a, have a hybrid named after you? Have to be somebody special. 
Yeah, they got to meet a lot of requirements. And then uh, it's one of the highlights of the year for our staff up here between all the different companies. And, and so we bring the new hybrids forward and then uh, we we pick names. And of course, we might have a beer or two while we're doing that. So it gets even more creative, uh, some of the names. And so we have a lot of fun with that. That's, that's, yeah, that's all part of the creative process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a comment and, and I don't know if people saw it or not as you were going through it, but there's the one picture where you're running your plot combine through one of those plots, you know, har harvesting mature corn, but the, the number of birds that were flying around that whole field, I mean, it was just, they were all over the place. Yep. And and that's got to be a sign of a good healthy ecosystem. You probably don't see near as much of that in more of a traditional environment. Yeah, I, I know that when farmers start buying our products in the, in the Dakotas, they have more wildlife damage than what they saw before. And some of them even tried to outsmart the wildlife by like planting GMO borders, you know, in 48, 90, 96 rows. The, the deer and uh, coon and stuff will walk right through it to get to the conventional corn and, and eat it. So, you know, we got to figure out something there. Maybe <laughs> the guys the planet and spread, spread the the animals up a little bit, but uh, that that's probably been the downside for guys who have switched if they've been in river bottoms and and things. They, they tend to have the livestock accumulate, but at the yeah. same time, it was, uh, the livestock that these guys are feeding with these non-GMO products are actually healthier. Their vet bills have gone down. You know, it's, it's anecdotal. I mean, I can't prove it, but they're they're the ones telling me this stuff. Is like our cattle are healthier, or you know, our animals are healthier when they made the switch, but boy, it's hard for them to make the switch. It really is. Yeah. Do, do you see a difference in, so you're, you're talking there about, you know, grain quality being fed to an animal. Do you see a difference in how the livestock, you know, if they're grazing corn stalks after harvest, the, the consumption rate, their ability to digest those stalks from your products versus others? Almost every producer we've worked with that grazes their cows out on stocks says they always go to the non-GMO ones first, always. Yeah. And they'll eat the other ones when there's nothing left. I mean, yeah. and, and you know, how do you argue with a cow? <laughs> they, they know it's difficult. Hard to argue. And, and that also solves the problem too. You know, some people, particularly if they're doing corn on corn and they're in high yield environments, they have a, a big residue issue. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they're growing a lot of corn in front of a lot of corn in front of a lot of corn. And as a north, you just don't have the the more mild, you know, season either before or after to help break those stocks down. So if you can run more of that stock through an animal, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in a GMO type field, they're probably cleaning up the ears, maybe eating some of the leaves, but not many of the stocks at all. Right. Whereas here, you can run a lot of the stocks through an animal. Yeah. You know, and, and so they tend to bail these up to, you know, for feed and bedding. And, and uh, so, it, yeah, they, it, it's interesting. Watch how the farmers' habits have changed. We've been working with them long enough now. And and uh, they, they get a little more excited and almost defensive a little bit of, you know, protecting the non-GMO products as being better than their, than the ones that they used previously. Yeah. yeah. And, and we, you know, we've got a few customers even that are really pushing the boundaries and they're, actually planting corn, you know, like this, you know, high management, high yield corn, but instead of harvesting it with a combine, they're strip grazing cattle through it, mm -hmm. uh, starting a tassel, but going all the way through mature corn and, you know, to, to essentially put weight on cattle right in the field versus doing it in a feedlot. And I would think that a product like these would be far superior for that. That That's really intriguing. I, I mean, and like, uh, it to me, I, the, we're just on the front end of discovering what we can do with some of these ideas. You know, we have people with, that have been using our corn and you know planting a sixty-inch gap and putting cover crops in mm -hmm. between. And they rotate into that sixty-inch space the next year, so they keep corn on corn, kind of, and then have the cover, and then they can graze their cattle on it. And and when I see those systems work now, it's our third year with several customers that way. And, they're figuring out how to make it work where their their income is probably before growing it more traditionally. Yeah. So that brings up a great point. Are you in, in a situation like that, you know, 
where you're you're going wide row spacing, say 60 inch, are you specifically developing or targeting varieties for that where you can maybe reduce your population overall a little bit and have a bigger flexier, uh, more upright light, more upright leaf structure, so you get more sunlight down to the cover crop canopy. Are you are you taking any of that into consideration in any of your selection process? So, so we came at it a little bit differently, Keith. As, as far as you, you know, the in, the trend in the industry is. And I mean, if you're a factory owner, you don't put two factories on the same location to double your output. There's usually a, a restriction inside that factory that you can double your output if you just make a 20% change, you know, and, and so that's the we, way we look at corn breeding is where we went to high stress breeding because uh, I, I used to watch plants that would, that would uh, you know, suffer from uh, no, you know, heat stress and no moisture. And the irrigation that we had, the, the ground was sloppy wet. They could not move the water up through the plant fast enough. After you get a few years of selection on or generations of selection, then you don't see that anymore. And so removing that in, in the, making the highways bigger inside the plant. And thus I want to make the plant work harder so that you as a grower, especially like in Nebraska, that where you get years with adequate rain, years without rain, you can plant a, let's say, a, a more neutral population instead of aggressive. And then you can take advantage of the ear with ear flex that will keep your yields up with higher populations. And then when it gets drier out, they're strong enough to put an ear on, you know, at the lower population, you know, without having to go to really low, make a commitment to a really low population. Yeah. And that's kind of the way we look at it. And then when you, the when we develop these products, they tend not to be as upright as modern hybrids. We're a little more uh, floppy on the ends, so they they're maybe a bigger solar panel. So that would be the downside a little bit to the sixty inch rows. We don't let the sunlight in. And but uh, you know, for me, yet our goal is still to produce corn first, and then yeah. as we learn more about this, we will. We'll keep tweaking the selection. And yeah. And and I think that in a 60 inch row, even the you know, if you're trying to do this in a 30 inch row and you have a real floppy leaf type plant, it just probably isn't going to work very well. But in a 60 inch row, there's still there's still a gap, there's still sunlight coming through. And having having the emphasis on a flexible year makes a big difference there too. Then yeah, and, and these things flex, I mean. There's amazing how much information that's been forgotten about since the 80s and 90s. When I go back and look at technical papers uh, about, uh, you know, what what constitutes, uh, oh, what do you call it? A real stress-tolerant hybrid is the ability to put multiple ears on. It's mm -hmm. one of them. And so, you know, because corn natively puts on multiple ears, like 10, 12 ears. And we selected it down to one now in our modern corn breeding. But when we do this stress work, we start to see, you know, two and three years start to show up again on these plants. So when we get a chance to produce, they're going to really produce and put them on. Now, the, the knock was when I first started the plant breeding in 1984 was we selected against two-eared hybrids because they would have a tendency to go barren first or the moisture of the harvested crop would go up because of that ear coming in, you know, five to seven days later than the initial ear. So your moisture would be up on your harvested product. With these products, we still, we maybe have about a two day delay, uh, you know, with flowering on the ears with, with this type of breeding work. And the, and the moisture would be up a little bit, but uh, the yield is significant when you work on these lower populations like that. And they, and they will dry down. It's just not as quick as a dye and dry hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. I like that dye and dry. You're you're wanting you're wanting your crop to go to full maturity um and not die and then dry down. So I uh, want to talk about in, you know that last little bit is when you're really packing in the minerals into those seeds. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the quality comes in there. I want to talk just a little bit about seed treatments. Willie is asking a question here. Uh, if you're using any neonicotinoids as seed treatments, either in your nursery or on the seed as you're selling it to, you know, people like us, the seed we got today or to others, 
what, what's your seed treatment strategy there? So when we develop in our nursery, we never use a seed treatment. And then when we uh, develop in the hybrids, when we're doing all these different locations, we do not use a seed treatment until the last two years of testing. And uh, my original thought was that would get us on equal footing with, with the competitors out there. The last two years of data has made me really think differently about that. But we're seeing, because we don't use any seed treatment in the development process, I think we're reducing our total yield by putting the seed treatment on. That's my current thought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got a lot of trials out this year to actually prove that right or wrong. Because that's, that's really interesting to think about, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, because again, better living through chemistry is what we were taught. And, or I was taught. And my, but the thing that would, implanted this in my brain is when uh, I first started the industry at a small family company and and uh, the plant breeder and the other guy started came from a, uh, actually my heritage family company a Trojan seed and and my boss Tom didn't want any seed treatment in his lab because he had enough captan in his life and uh, he had allergy problems from it and so we just didn't do it well, you know, when you're in a small family company where, you know, six or seven hats, you know, forklift driving, roof repair to agronomy work or plant breeding, whatever it is. And when I would go on agronomy calls where we had stand establishment issues for Kelshen, uh, I never once went on a call where we developed the embryos without seed treatment and hybrids without seed treatment. It was always when we insourced genetics from somebody else. Those are the ones we had issues on those cold, wet springs. And so that just kind of stuck with me and I just continued it. And it fits with my no poison policy with uh, the family around, you know, as, as much as possible. Yeah. And so that's why I'm making a statement. I, so our seed is always kept untreated. And then we treat it to the customer specifications. You know, we're, we're pushing a rope uphill a lot with everything we're doing. And so if we have a customer that wants uh, the chemistry on with a neonic, we'll, we'll put it on but I'm reluctantly doing that. I want I want to get to the point, if I can develop enough data this year, say, no, we're going all biological seed treatments, that's it, or naked. You can get it either way, but we're not going to put chemistry on anymore. Because I, I just want the toxic waste out of our warehouse too. Yeah. You yeah. Can. So, so if you're looking for a place to buy naked seed or untreated seed, uh, here, here's an option for you anyway. Talk, talk a little bit about the biological seed treatments that you have used or you're looking at using or potentially could use you don't have to get into great detail but you know is it like a compost extract type product is it are you putting mycorrhiza on what what are some of the things you're looking at when you evaluate a biological seed treatment so we we looked at all, all kinds of them either between our contract research work and then as we find things that are interesting to us and we apply them in our, on our, the genetics we develop because we try and keep a line there between our work and our customers' work. But if we find something interesting that benefits our brand, we're going to do that. Uh, right now, we're working strictly with bacteria. Mycorrhizae is too complicated to figure out how you're going to put that on the seed at this moment. I mean, their guys are better off maybe using it as a planter box if they want to put that on and where we can actually get six months of uh, lifespan for biologicals applied to the seed. And that, of course, is the easiest method to, to use it. Uh, you know, we're open. Uh, this, my friend from KMR, uh, Kyle, he's working with, with uh, extracts now, you know, from a Johnson Sioux bioreactor to see what that does. Uh, yeah. So we're in our infancy, like, you know, we're, we're just... It's like undiscovered country for us. We got to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so, like I said, we're not putting anything on it. Maybe I'll put biological yeah. phrase on or something, but that'll be about it. So, you know, in in thinking about the mycorrhizal associations, and, and you're right, it is a complicated thing to, to understand as well as to test and to study. Do you evaluate your hybrids at all that, you know, that you're growing, the selections? Are you looking at all about how well do they colonize mycorrhiza? Because I know that's kind of been one of the things kicked around a lot is a lot of these new modern varieties, they've kind of bred those associations out unintentionally, but mm -hmm. because of the environment they farmed in, they've just naturally deselected for that. Are you looking at those associations at all? So it's interesting to say that, you know, because I've been 
I, I listen to John Kim find your podcast. I listen to him uh, regularly on his on his show as well. And we both are kind of coming towards. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not in his league or anything. I'm just saying that you know he came at better seed and plant health through soils, and I'm looking at it from a genetic standpoint. Why are our plants so healthy? You know what what are they doing? And so to step back from that. When I first started corn breeding, you know, there was a lot of stock lodging, root lodging. And so to help select through that, we put a lot of nitrogen on because nitrogen would induce stock lodging for you because it produced bigger than the stock could handle, select against the one that's fall down, recycle, move on. Well, because of that, we've trained our corn hybrids to be lazy. They, they want all the groceries handed to them and sitting there, <laughs> you know. And when we did our, our uh, stress breeding, you know, and I cut the water, I cut our fertilizer because that's how I, how I put on most of it is through the drip tape, you know, in Puerto Rico. And that got me going. And, and, uh, and so I, then we developed these hybrids. It's like, why are they staying alive in the fall? They're not dying and they're not drying down. What's going on? Well, they, they uh, have massive root systems. And with these big root systems, it looks like they're making friends with the microorganisms in the soil. And, and so I haven't done any real studies. Those are going to start this year now. What are, what are the corn roots attracting? You know, in the papers that I've read is that there's certain uh, bacteria that wraps itself around the root and holds 200 times its weight in water. Well, you know, their organisms are going to excrete something that the plant wants to eat. And the plant in turn is creating sugar that the, that the bacteria wants to consume. And one of the crazy things that we learned accidentally again uh, by, you know, cutting silage in, in Puerto Rico is that we have a much higher sugar content in our corn when it's attacked by a pest. You know, the sugar readings are naturally high, just, you know, the high bricks, I should say. And then when they're under attack, it goes off the charts. And, but again, with that high uh, sugar content, it's probably going to attack, uh, attract a lot of bacteria and fungi to those roots too. And I mean, the, the world of communication, you know, the mycorrhiza is, is mind-blowing to me how that works. And, and uh, you know, now you start studying about horizontal transfer of genes between one guy. And it's like, oh, I get really nervous <laughs> <laughs> about what we're doing, you know, in the world. Yeah. So, the yeah. No, and, and you bring up a couple of very interesting things here. So uh, Willie Pretorius, uh, with he works with Ward Labs. I'm actually going to have... Uh, a brunch with him tomorrow in Omaha. I'll visit with him about it because he's got some developing some testing methods for mycorrhizal associations. I'll, I'll get the two of you guys connected so you can kind of talk down that path. I think it would be a mutually beneficial conversation. But you you also brought up a question that I was going to ask about bricks. You know, you showed that picture of your stress insect stress nursery and all these plants that are kind of obliterated, and then these that look great. Did you do a, a just a bricks test on the leaf tissue of those to know was there significant differences there? No, and I could kick myself for it. You know, it's just one of those things in the heat of the battle. You know, we're busy trying to pollinate, and it's like, well, I, I should have just taken the ten minutes to to, to test a few plants. You mm -hmm. know, so standard operating equipment now is going to be bricks meters along in our pollinating apron. So you can just take a quick look and make a note if we see something intriguing. Yeah, because you know. that would have been really interesting to know, because you know, obviously the soil conditions across that plot probably weren't that much different. So whatever difference was happening was happening genetically and how that plant was associating with biology and utilizing the nutrients and the minerals that it had available in the soil. Yeah. And, you know, with that, that's why I'm really interested in, you know, working with you guys and, and understanding cover crops better because I, I want to, I think we can develop uh, symbiotic crops with each other, you know, with, with uh, you know, specific covers to enhance the corn uh, growth and yield, you know, instead of, of applying synthetic fertilizer, let's let Mother Nature produce it for us. And are, are you talking about a cover crop grown before the corn or maybe even with the corn? I, I don't know. I, I'm, I want to try it all and see what works. I mean, that that's mm -hmm. where we're at. It's, it's like we don't know what we don't know until we start playing around with a little bit and and just 
push things in the direction we want to go. I'm almost afraid to apply biologicals that we know are beneficial to our developing nurseries because I don't want to influence which way they go. I want to keep them working to develop the relationship with what's already occurring in the soil. And if we can jumpstart what's in the soil by using the right cover crops, to me, that's better than applying synthetic, bio, uh, even biology, much mm -hmm. less chemicals. If we can just, each soil is going to be unique in what it supports. And, and I, I know that the microbes kind of alter themselves to the crop a little bit. You know, the little bit of I, I've read up on this and, and uh, you know, it just kind of interests to see if we can get symbiosis then between the different crops. Because, uh, you know, a couple of scientists have come out and said that if, if you have 12 different species in your cover crop, it's like you're growing 12 different crops all in one year. And yeah. that's how your biology is. And that, that's just mind blowing to me. And here we are in a monocrop system. Let's go plant some corn. Let's go plant some soybeans. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's what? You know, that. Uh, yeah, we're we're definitely big believers and promoters of that diversity and trying to get the plant diversity to get the biological diversity and but that's hard to do if all you're doing is a corn soybean rotation uh, because you can't get that level of diversity in your cover crop if you're always planting in October or November so yeah. that's where we like to see a cereal grain even if it's once every four or five years in your rotation because you know that's harvested in middle of the summer. Now you can get the 12, 15 way species blend in, have a good growing period and really set the biological table then for the next four or five years. Yeah, so. that's intriguing. I, I, I never thought about it like in a five year time span until talking to you, you know, what, how long those benefits actually last and, you know, thinking hey, we got to do it every year. How do we do this? Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds, sounds like we need to get some cover crops down to Puerto Rico and I need to come down in December to inspect those is what it sounds like to me. Yeah, I, I'd say it's going to take a few inspections probably to figure it out. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounds great. I look forward to that. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that that kind of uh, brings us to the end of our time or end of our hour here. Uh, appreciate uh, everybody watching. I know there'll be a lot of people watching this online too. I guess maybe just in closing, Ed, if People are interested in learning more about the products that you have, the process that you do it. Uh, just go ahead and mention your website. Maybe people can go to to probably get all the information that they need. Yeah, basshybrids.com. And they can call the phone numbers there. They can email us or call the office. Someone answers the phone. Not quite 24-7, but we, we answer. Like you, you know, you're an independent business. You don't want to miss a call. Yeah, so. yeah. So, yeah, I would encourage you if you want to learn more to, to check that out. Uh, good people over there. Uh, uh, one of your guys, Andrew, was actually at one of our Regenerative Nexus Summits. So that's kind of how we got connected and 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 uh, started the conversation here. We're looking forward to the test plot that we're putting in with a number of your uh, hybrid lines. We'll maybe have some videos and follow up with that later in the season as, as we see that progressing. But uh, thanks so much, Ed, for your time. We appreciate that. Thanks for all your work within uh, an industry that typically ignores or tolerates regenerative practices. You are embracing them and using them to develop uh, better products. And so we're very appreciative of that. So thank you very much. And thanks, everybody. This is the end of this series. Uh, we will be starting another series uh, later this summer. Uh, around grazing and uh, livestock utilization. So stay tuned for more information on that. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate it, Keith. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Mm -hmm.